I was terrified, first of all, that I was going to have to be naked Mm -hmm. and that I was going to have to be naked in front of people because that's kind of like, you don't know what to expect. Oh, and then like Eve shows up and you know, Adam and Eve are Mm -hmm. naked in the garden. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like, this is a test. There isn't anything, as you said, that's just like really profound. It's just like keeping people busy Mm -hmm. and then being like, oh, like it's your fault if you're not getting anything from it. Hello, it's your favorite YouTubers back from the holidays. Back from the f***ing dead that was family <laughs> Christmas. Just kidding, I had a great time. <laughs> how was all y'all's holidays? What'd you do? We were just talking before we turned the camera on about how we both binged all of White Lotus over Christmas. Twice. <laughs> so good, so good. If you haven't seen it, highly recommend. What else, what else has been going on? Uh, happy Andrew Tate gets arrested day for those who celebrate. <laughs> Beautiful, absolutely stunning. It was, it's nice when the universe hands a little thing Just like that. Gift. Just yeah. one. Yeah, I told Tana to dress fancy for this video because I was thinking we would do, you know, uh, cocktail attire to kick off the new year, but. Is this not cocktail attire? I ended up not doing that. So, oh. Tana's in a double breasted. What even is that? How do you describe it's, that? It's, I don't know. It's fancy. It's, it feels kind of fancy. And it's velvet, so. Yeah. I kind of feel like Satan from the Mormon Temple movie. Yeah, At least the one I'm acquainted with, if I was like a modern one, like. If they do not walk up to every covenant they make in this house this day, they will be in my power. Did that work? Does... I, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I should have got the role. And I like the idea of kind of a modern bisexual Satan. Yeah, back in the day, it was a black Satan, and that was right. very explicit. Now, queer. <laughs> queer, yeah. yeah. Whoever the enemy du jour is. Yes. <laughs> yes, you also read too much. Yep. Well, we're talking about the Mormon Temple today, and if you've been subscribed for a while, you may know that we have already done a video on our Mormon Temple experience, but the thing about being on YouTube for seven, eight years is that sometimes the things that you do, while continuing to get tons of views, are very cringe, so you make them private, and then you Start do them from, again. Yep. Yeah, with uh, the insight of an older, wiser person. Yeah, just pretend you've never seen that if you have, and we're going to be sharing our stories So for those of you who are not raised in Mormonism, the Latter-day Saint Temple is like uh, a central point in LDS theology, doctrine, and practice. Um, Latter-day Saints believe that the temple gives people power to have their families together for all eternity. I was so it was odd when I'd pitch that to people on the mission. I'd be like, "Don't you want to live with your family forever?" And they're like, Like, "No." (laughs) And I'd be like, "Wait, what?" And they're like. Yeah, I don't want to live with my family forever. And I'd be like, oh, uh, well, if you do everything I tell you, then you'll want to. And won't that be great? <laughs> you know, it is kind of ironic because the, the types of people most likely to join a high demand religion like Mormonism are probably people who are estranged from their family. Mm. Just saying. Interesting. But also, tons of religions believe they'll be with their families in I the know. next life. And they don't. it doesn't even have to be such a point because it's just assumed. Like, yeah, obviously God wouldn't separate families. Mm. Obviously he would. Okay. So... Uh, Temple building started with Joseph Smith, and it's kind of evolved uh, through Mormon history, which is ironic because Joseph Smith also taught that the temple ordinances should never, ever change. In fact, that's like a key point of LDS theology, that the reason that the original Christ's original church apostatized and lost the truth and its authority is because they changed the ordinances. There's a scripture in Isaiah that talks about Mm. they've changed the ordinances and blah, 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 blah. And And didn't Joseph Smith say that if they ever change... That that would be a sign that the church has lost its priesthood power? Yeah, I don't know if Joseph Smith specifically, but there's there's tons of quotes floating around by various leaders to that effect mm-hmm. that um, if these things were to change, the, ch- the church would lose its truth and mm-hmm. authority and all that. I'm sure Joseph Smith didn't say that. It may, I could be I'm wrong. Sure he did. Nobody could, quote me. Yeah. If you got the quote, throw it in the comments. <laughs> the, uh, I think it can is an uncontested fact that there is a lot of dialogue around the ordinances needing to be very similar. So much so that like baptism, um, you know, they talk about the Catholics doing the little water on the head is like mm-hmm. totally invalid. They changed that, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be full immersion. And the temple used to be that way. They used to have all kinds of, uh, they do like washing and anointing where you were in a bathtub with some guy rubbing whiskey and oil on you and then blessing all your different parts, mm-hmm. including your genitals. And then, and now they only do that symbolically. So riddle me that. Riddle me that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have anything to say. Sometimes you just say, repeat what you said you in know, a different voice. It works for YouTube. And, happens, <laughs> and yeah. actually a lot of social situations. It's so true. <laughs> it's so true. 
and I am trying to gain basic social skills this year, so we're after a good If anyone start. has any advice. Yeah, mirroring. <laughs> Little tricks. To do that. Yeah. <laughs> we're just going <laughs> to... That was like kind of like the temple. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so the significance of the Mormon temple in Mormons' lives. I mean, first of all, I feel like temples are a big justification for the church taking 10% of your income. Not mm-hmm. like the only one or the main one, but... They sure spend a lot of billions of dollars on the temples. Yes. Which, and if you don't pay 10% of your income, you can't go in them. Was it John who was telling us that it's also part of like um, a tax strategy? Like if they're building enough oh, temples sure, yeah. on enough land, mm-hmm. then there's certain tax loopholes that they get through. So they're very incentivized to keep building, even if the membership growth can't keep <clears> up with the building. Yeah, which, by the way, like, the word on the street lately is that Nelson keeps announcing all these temples, but the temple department is scrambling because normally you don't have a prophet announcing temples where, like, there hasn't even been any approval for that temple to be, like, built in that location or anything. Mm -hmm. But he's kind of just having a manifesting attitude to it and (laughs) announcing these temples that may or may not get built. I think there's more about that on Mormon Stories, so if you're interested... Hunt around, good luck. He's just girl bossing his way girl into... Girl bossing his way into <laughs> getting all the tax write-offs. And, you know, and, and it'll probably work. I mean, it's like, oh, yeah, this is impossible. He's like, figure it out. And the Mormon church has a lot of money, and they can probably yeah. afford to make it happen. So, yeah, lots of temples being built. And, again, it's like a very central part of the Mormon experience. I started going to the temple as a youth around 12 years old, I think, is when you can start going to do vicarious ordinances for people who have died. The really chill practice of baptizing dead people as a 12 year old, (laughs) not a cult. And it's, you know, it's funny if you crunch the numbers on that, which we've talked about at different points here that like, um, well, yeah. So how many billions of people, there's 7 billion people on the earth today. Um, maybe I forget the actual number of how many billions have like in total been on the planet, but of those billions, only like 0.02% will ever like Mm. see a Mormon temple. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like God has this plan for everyone where they just kind of do what they want, but then a bunch of Mormons will baptize them for the dead during a span of a thousand years, even though that work could actually be done very quickly. Yep. And I think the idea is that Mm -hmm. if you just keep people busy and paying and attending this thing where they feel good and have that ritualistic aspect it's it's good to give people meaning and purpose and like what better meaning and purpose than literally like the salvation of dead people hinges on you very narcissistic when you think (laughs) about it also for anyone who's not familiar with the thousand years thing can you explain that Oh yeah, the Mormons believe that after Jesus comes back, he'll usher in the millennium. Day. Yeah, any day, it's imminent. It's been imminent for 2,000 years and that will never change. You're on the ragged edge, <laughs> I can feel it. I'm coming, I'm coming. He's coming, and then Mormons get to spend a 1,000 years, or everyone spends a 1,000 years, everyone who makes it. Yeah, everyone who's Just in like the doing good graces. family history work and baptizing, okay, all baptizing the dead, people. dead people. Yeah, so that's going to be really fun. That's kind of a perk of surviving Jesus's second coming where a lot of the wicked people will be wiped out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a thousand years of family history work. Can't wait. It sounds really fun. Everyone's super jazzed mm. about it now, so imagine. Yeah, I love how <laughs> even in Mormonism, everyone's like, but won't that be boring? Like, yeah, but you'll be in a different mindset mm-hmm. by then, so it will be actually really fun. Yeah, you're going to have different chemicals coursing through your body. It's just yeah. going to be like MDMA Adderall all the time. City. <laughs> so there's the baptisms for the dead when you're 12. You start doing that. But where shit really gets real is when you get endowed, right? Yeah. Which is usually if you're a boy when you're going on a mission at 19 Mm -hmm. for you. Um, And usually for women, it's been when they get married that they'll get endowed, unless they go on a mission. But because the mission age used to be higher, it still is higher for women by one year. But because it used to be 21, a lot of Mormon girls would be married off by 21, so... And also going on missions in the past as a woman was almost seen as something you did if you were unmarriable you couldn't for some get reason. Married, yeah. yeah, no one wanted you. So if you're twenty two and unmarried, <clears throat> you're just an old maid, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we've kind of had the classic Mormon gendered Mormon uh, endowment experience because I got endowed when I was getting married mm. and you got endowed before your mission. Yep. Well endowed. Beautiful. What did you know about the temple but because you're a convert? Um, Oof, yeah. How was that pitched to you? How did you prepare? What was your experience like going through? Well, so I did the baptisms for the dead thing in England at like 18, I think, a year after I got baptized or whenever it was. And that was fine. You know, it's peaceful in there. Everything's why. I, it's, it's got a reverent atmosphere, which 
nothing about it was too spooky, basically, because mm. you're just, you know, doing, getting dunked in the water. In those see-through jumpsuits. Oh my God, yeah, nightmare. Getting out of the water and not knowing if you're going to have one of the jumpsuits that goes completely see-through, which you know happens because, you know, the Rexburg everyone's temple. sitting watching. Yeah, you fucking watch their ass as they cry. Oh my God, absolute nightmare. But, I mean, a, a big thing with the Mormon temple, it's got less so recently, but like it's been secretive, right? For most mm. of its existence, people haven't known what they're, si I mean, they still don't fully know most of the time what they're signing up for when they go in, in, when we're speaking about the endowment. So, you know, right before I got endowed, by that point, I'd kind of been having a bit of a faith crisis. So maybe knew a little bit more than some people would know going through it. But yeah, that's right. It was pretty late in. Yeah. But I also, I didn't know that. I mean, I didn't know mm. that much. I knew there was like some kind of video. I knew there was, I don't know if I knew there were going to be handshakes. I didn't know about all the like moving the sash onto the different shoulder, the like whole dress routine. Mm. Yeah. So, um, I suppose I didn't know that much. And also when I was baptized into Mormonism, I didn't know there was magic underwear. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they don't tell you that. You don't have to know that to get baptized, fun fact. So you went through the temple before me, so let's let's talk about your experience. But also, what I mean, I assume based on knowing you that you were just super jazzed your whole life for this experience. Oh, yeah, because it is like a, a rite of passage mm -hmm. where you're like, trend, you're like officially an adult. And that's how I felt getting in doubt. I was like, once I had the garment on, I was like, I remember just standing in the bathroom looking in the mirror being like, whoa, yes, I did it. Like, I'm an adult. Aww. Like, And then after a couple of years, I was like, I got to get out of these. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was like really looking forward to it. Um, like you said, it was sort of um, uh, shrouded secretive sacred mm -hmm. um thing where they don't they don't speak very explicitly about the temple it's but they do kind of try and prepare you that like <laughs> it is weird and then everyone makes jokes about how like you're gonna have to ride a ball naked <laughs> they almost like say more extreme things to make you feel like it's not that bad when you actually go through because i do think it's somewhat universal that people go through and get a feel for like this is quite culty yeah i mean and not maybe not everyone because if you've just been so immersed in mormonism your whole life maybe you wouldn't but but for the average yeah. person it's a little because it's totally different than the normal mormon sunday to sunday mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. right and you're not a, even like members that have both gone through the temple you're not really supposed to talk about what happens in the temple outside the temple right mm. so it is like this very um secretive place which they sort of try to prepare you for by saying you know it takes a lot of faith and you know you mm. kind of go in thinking like okay i need to be prepared for any weird thing that could happen yes you've really been primed and that accept. that was kind of how i felt was like oh mm. this is gonna it's gonna be weird because they do that they're like just prepare for it to be really mm. weird and i was like oh, this you is won't gonna understand like... everything at first <sighs> it's gonna be confusing it's all symbolic yeah do you never get to get clarity on what the symbols are supposed mm -hmm. to represent, but... And you spend your whole life learning what the symbols truly mean. <laughs> kind of fun in that way, because then nobody can verify it, and because yep. you're not supposed to talk about it, you can't yep. compare notes. But you are just supposed <laughs> to believe that this is an experience that you couldn't possibly figure out quickly, that you're uh, going to have to keep going your whole life to figure out. And it's like, I mean, if it is symbolic, I feel like the symbols aren't that... I mean, a, a symbol is a symbol. How complicated can it be? It's like the sash represents this. The apron represents this. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they all represent at this point in my life. But. Mm. And in some cases, they're somewhat explicit <clears throat> about it, but you're still supposed to like... Keep digging. Yeah. See what else is there. I kind of went in like being like, Ooh, it's going to be a test of faith. I'm ready for whatever. And I remember going in and seeing... I went. I got endowed in the Mesa Temple, which is kind of a unique building. It's supposed to be like after Solomon's Temple, so it doesn't mm -hmm. have a spire. It's like squarical. Cute. And um, there's a big staircase, and I saw a person walking down the staircase in their full temple garb and just being like, whoa, that's, that's a... That's Jesus. That's... There he is. There he is new. <laughs> I didn't expect to see him dressed as a Keebler elf, but, uh, <laughs> you know, because I got these, like, baker hat and apron and... Um, they don't prepare you for the costume. I think don't. you just imagine something all white, and obviously... Well, and they talk about temple robes, and there is kind of, like, a robe thing, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, the but costume very is very bakery. And mm. very, um... Well, Masonic as well. Yeah, definitely Masonic. Um, that's an important fact to understand, that uh, Joseph Smith instituted the endowment two months after he was initiated into Freemasonry. And it's interesting because prior to that, uh, Joseph Smith had been very anti-Masonic 
and following a a cultural consensus, like there was a lot of anti-Masonic rhetoric in the area Joseph Smith was in for most of his life. In fact, the Book of Mormon is very laden with anti-Masonic rhetoric. Um, A lot of the bad guys are wearing like... uh, skin, uh, sheepskin aprons or oh, whatever, oh. and they have their secret combinations, which was a cultural code word for I hate when you write Masonic the book stuff. before you do the concert. It's kind of like the, the uh, trinity that's throughout the Book yeah. of Mormon, but then eventually yeah. Joseph Smith scraps the trinity, and so they have to change the Book of Mormon. And, yeah, at a certain point, surely, he'd have to be like, well, I can't change everything. Like, yeah. Some stuff's just going to have to stay. And because he's writing about a, you know an alleged <clears throat> American Native American culture. He can't be like Freemasons, but he's obviously drawing from all Mm -hmm. that imagery. But then, you know, being at war with the state of Illinois, I think he was uh, just trying to make allies Mm -hmm. and saw Freemasonry as a way of um, seeking some alternative ways of protection. In fact, when he was killed in Carthage jail for burning down a printing press that was telling the truth about him, uh, he made some Mas- he did the Masonic symbol of distress, um, believing that the Freemasons in the mob would be obliged to help him. They obviously thought different because they oh, yeah. uh, some of them thought he had stolen the Masonic ceremony, which mm. you know two months after being initiated, and then Just he's like, "We're gonna do the exact same handshakes. We're gonna wear uh, almost the exact same getup. Walk through this like ritual drama." Mm. Uh, I suppose the, very the best apologetics you can make about that as a believer is God led him to the Masonic ceremony because for some reason that's where he was supposed to learn because the Masonic ceremony is is mostly really good and true and what he should be using for Mormonism yeah but that's a weird that's weird that you know what so God's hand was in the Masonic ceremony or he couldn't have come up with a new thing I think I think that's that uh, uh, <clears throat> Masonic myth that Freemasonry traces back to Solomon's temple so mm-hmm. it's like they have this like uh, diluted version of the mm. temple ceremony, and Joseph they, Smith is restoring the original that? one. Like, do the Masons think that? They, I think there is lore to that effect, but it's not true. There's like a, an era, like the 1500s or something, where a lot of these like mystical fraternities are popping up a, again as a way of solidifying power in a poor, like a labor class, uh, trying to seek solidarity and. Uh, they don't have unions, but they can have see, fraternities, yeah, secret fraternities, it. and yeah. it does make sense. But then they also have this <clears throat> mystical lore, which is not true. Mas- masonry does not trace to Solomon's mm. Temple. Like, it literally was just made up by actual masons around that time. you got to have lore. you got to. you got to. Whether you're <clears throat> Rosicruc- Rosicrucian, what is that called? Or, yeah. Also, it's worth noting... Because didn't Joseph and Trainer. like get the temple ceremony going as a way to like you know get men who are practicing polygamy sort of like in this secret club with him? Like it was a you know it's a ritual you can it, rituals are an important way of like bonding people in secret clubs, right? Yeah, and and uh, I I don't know if like polygamy had a direct. I mean everything is connected yeah, in it, yeah. and definitely initiating people into. Polygamy was a part, like, with the garment and mm-hmm. things being a, a step in that. But I, f- I think even just in a general sense, a way of uh, of solidifying control mm-hmm. or influence as you're bringing people into closer and closer levels of secrecy. Um, and initially, the, the temple was very... Um, to the church's credit, they have taken out a lot of the things that were problematic about the temple, even despite saying that they should never change and that they can't remove Mm -hmm. anything or they're just committing the same sins as the Catholic Church or whatever. But, you know, they they used to promise that if they talked about it, their throat would be slit and their Mm -hmm. bowels ripped out and their tongue removed. And uh, (coughs) you used to have to swear to avenge the blood of Joseph Smith and Mm -hmm. Hiram Smith on the state of Illinois or whatever. And... um, used to have a much more uh, sexist language. Satan was identified as a Christian Mm. preacher who was black, uh, like explicitly a skin of blackness. I mean, you see Joseph Smith, who is at the same time he's establishing the temple thing, also taking a bunch of polygamous wives, um, many of whom are underage, 
and you have and he's having the secret ceremony where people are being sworn to silence and there's various stages of like physical contact that's being initiated like i said washing people blessing mm. people in it's various giving parts. the vow it's giving the vow you haven't seen the vow it's a documentary about the nexium cult keith ranieri very similar yeah um, but again, you don't get, you, they're not going to tell you any of this stuff up front for as much as they try to prepare you. It's all just kind of like, so um, it's all just kind of generic information. So before going to the temple, when I was, I did a, um, one year of college before my mission and I took a temple prep class. I also read uh, Boyd K. Packer's book, The Holy Temple, because uh, I really wanted to be prepared but all you pretty much get from it is what we've said. Like, it's very symbolic. You're going to be, um, you have to have like the utmost standards of worthiness. You're going to be making covenants that are very serious. So you have to be like really devoted and ready to accept. But then you actually don't really know what the actual proceedings are going to be mm-hmm. like. So I showed up, I saw the guy walking down. <clears> I was like, Ooh, that looks <clears> weird, but whatever, like I'm ready. My biggest fear as a 19 year old boy who had never had any... Uh, you know, had no healthy release for my sexuality. Um, I was terrified, first of all, that I was going to have to be naked Mm -hmm. and that I was going to have to be naked in front of people because that's kind of like, you don't know what to expect other than like, it will be weird. You are going to be like, there's going to be some, Mm -hmm. you know, things. I'm like, oh God, am I going to have to be naked in front of people? Am I going to get an erection in front of a temple full of people? Like just freaking out about that. Um, And then they start this movie which is like going through the creation scene and it's supposed to be symbolic and yet symbolic of what? So yeah, so you sit down and you're just in like your, your temple whites, white shirt, white tie, white pants, white shoes, and you sit down in this basically like a film, uh, a movie theater, a nice fancy movie theater. Imagine you're at the Grand America and they have a, <laughs> <It's so true. laughs> a Grand America hotel and they got this movie theater and nice murals on the side in a lot of the temples and... Uh, they show this movie about the creation of the, the planet and you have Elohim and Jehovah and Michael who are creating the thing and just like the minutia of their conversation is very Masonic, um, but also just so boring. It's like, mm-hmm. we will go down and we will create tigers and bears and fishes and small rocks. And, and he's like, yes, we will go down and make tigers and fishes and small rocks. And they just keep doing that kind of dialogue for like an hour while they create the earth. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because it's supposed to be symbolic, but it's like symbolic Mm -hmm. of what, why did we have to go through all those things? And then Mormons still believe in like Mm -hmm. a creationist earth, even though that whole thing is symbolic and obviously has a lot of plot holes because like Adam, yeah, then Adam and Eve are created and you're watching this and you're supposed to be like, oh, represent like, they tell you, you and each of you are represented as Adam and Eve. So, you know, when Adam stands up, all the men stand up and Mm. uh, at some point the women veil their faces. Though I don't think they do that anymore. They've stopped the women veiling their faces. Which is nice. Good for them. Good for them. Also, though, I feel like when I was watching the movie, I I was a little bit, well, maybe not disappointed because I wouldn't have allowed myself to feel disappointment, but you're sort of told before going to the temple that you're going to learn some big secrets mm. some, but you really don't learn really anything don't. <laughs> it's like all just shit you've heard before packaged in like a more cryptic way or whatever but I, it's like I was watching the film expecting to like learn some big truth or yeah. big secret but it's kind of just like rehashed Genesis mm-hmm. with like really corny sets mm-hmm. and costumes though now I think they're getting better with the CGI yeah uh, it's so getting maybe a little bit more Planet entertaining Earth, which is nice um Oh man, because they used to do just live dramas and they still do in the Salt Lake Temple and maybe like the Manti Temple where people come out and act and boy, it was hard to stay awake. I always wish that I could act as Satan because he was the most dramatic and was like, oh, it'd be so fun to play Satan. Didn't they originally have someone doing blackface to play oh, yeah. Satan? Yeah, back yeah. in the day because because Satan was explicitly black and, and black they didn't have movies so the they were temple. doing, yeah, they weren't allowed to go so they were literally doing a blackface yeah. drama play in the temple. <laughs> so good. Inspired. And then, you know, all the the curses and penalties and <laughs> mm-hmm. used to be a rip roar and fun time and used to be way longer, like five oh, hours God. or Can something. Can you imagine it being any long what was it when we do like two and a half or yeah. something? <sighs> and I think it's getting shorter and shorter, Absolute which nightmare. they're smart for doing that because in this day and age, who's got the no one's going to want to keep going Absolutely through it. Absolutely no one. So you didn't get an erection in the end. That's good. Well, and oh, and then like Eve shows up and you know, they're, Adam and Eve are mm. naked in the garden. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like, this is a test. Like, I can't, you know, I'm 
19 years old. This is a little bit of shoulder. <laughs> I know. And I'm like, oh, please. And this is not like, mm. this is a test. <laughs> but no erection. No. You made it through. I can't, I can't actually remember. I don't want to <laughs> promise. <laughs> but I just was like uh, frightened that that was going to mm. be the experience and was very relieved when it wasn't. Mm. But yeah, it was just kind of nervous. And then, so you go through the, the movie and... Adam and Eve, they get kicked out of the garden. Mm. They meet Satan and um, the apostles. <laughs> and they're mm. not like, hey, fellow humans, what are you doing here? We were the first humans. They're just like, oh, hi. Like, not addressed by the fact that, you know, it doesn't line up with an actual creationist narrative. And that's so it's like, that part's supposed to be mm. symbolic. Eh, I don't know. But then the these apostles, Peter, James, and John, they teach Adam and Eve the signs the signs and tokens that they will eventually use to essentially get to heaven. And that is a series of handshakes and passwords, essentially, mm. that you are then tested with <clears throat> at the end of the, the procession. So you watch these things, you know, and at the point in the movie where they're learning the things, some these old couple comes around and they do the handshake with everybody and then you're putting on different costumes that are represented by Adam and Eve's progression, like... Oh, they've got coats of skin, so now we have clothes on, and they have this leaf apron, so now everyone is wearing an apron. And it's so just, like, tiring and annoying. It would literally be like, put this sash on your right shoulder, and then you sit down and something else happens, and then it's like, now stand up and put it on your left shoulder. and mm. Yeah. And it, up, down, up, down. It is such an interesting look into uh, group ritual psychology mm-hmm. and how just, like, giving because again you go in like expecting to be taught something new or profound or a new okay. insight but you're just given these like fairly normal I mean like it's a weird experience but like just basic stuff mm-hmm. and because you're not allowed to talk about it everyone can kind of project their own meanings to it so some people are like oh the things I learned in the temple are so precious and it's like only because you applied your creative analytical faculties to it in the same way that if you did that to anything else in any other situation in a nice building where people are talking in hushed tones you might get some clarity in like a nice garden or something I certainly do Mm -hmm. Uh, but there isn't anything as you said that's just like really profound or impressive it's just like keeping people busy and letting them Mm -hmm. and then being like oh like it's your fault if you're not getting anything from it Right. (laughs) And of course people have profound sort of insights or experiences in like very quiet settings. I used to be like, wow, this is the most beautiful thing on earth. And and there are some temples that are like the architecture is interesting, but I feel like they get less and less. So it kind of feels like the McMansion approach to... 100%. Yeah. Like you see temples from other cultures. Some of the Hindu temples or uh, things that are like so artistic and elaborate. And again, maybe in the church's history, it was more like that where, you know, people are staying up hand carving and now it just feels like they get a temple shipped from Ikea and Mm -hmm. set it up. So what was your overall feeling? going through the temple for the first time it was it was honestly kind of just it was like a relief Mm, it the thing worked where i was expecting it to be really scary and weird and then it was only moderately weird and then um at the end you know you do the little you do all the handshakes and um i don't know if people care to be initiated into that right now or if we need to show that. <laughs> like, can you remember them all? Yeah, the first... I don't think we need to show them. Yeah, okay. There's some <laughs> silly little handshakes. Um, each with their associated names and whatever. So you get to the end and you, um, someone has their hand through this veil, this big veil, and um, it has Masonic signs on it that are also on the individual garments that members are instructed to wear throughout their lives to keep protect them from the power of the destroyer which is why they get a reputation as magic underwear because they literally believe it has power to protect them um from fire yeah so um you go through and there you end up in the slush room so you start in like the garden room then you go to the telestial kingdom or and now it's all kind of consolidated but then the terrestrial room and then the celestial room is the last place and my whole extended family was in mm. there and so you walk in and you're like well this is going to be just like heaven you die you pass through the veil your whole family's there waiting for you it's beautiful and so i walked through and i cried and i was like oh mm-hmm. yay but i don't know that i like got anything from the experience other than that just like having done it i'm an adult now opa let's go to yes. lunch and um 
and then I would return various times. Um, I went a couple times on the mission in the MTC, and then um, and then in college in Rexburg went pretty often mm. until the faith crisis when I just found it like I would go and just have anxiety and it, it kind of because <clears throat> school was just so in, I mean school is tough like it's mm. hard to be in college there's just so much going on you have such a huge workload I was working like three jobs to being a stake executive secretary which is like way too much free for labor for any kid, yeah. yeah it was just in, absurd and I'd go to the temple as this like I just need like some peace I need answers I need this and I'd go and just feel nothing and just be like doing this rote thing and watching the same movie that I've watched a million times and have like squeezed ex- every drop of personal meaning from and like maybe the three mm-hmm. uh, combinations here are representative of the God and this and this and this and the first presidency is that and the atonement and like really just in my brain to get something but it's like you can only do that so many times where you're like okay I need something new and something about the experience was just like I found like just Mm -hmm. even without being able to put a finger on it I just felt so anxious and just kind Mm -hmm. of like was like didn't even make the decision I just didn't go as much because it was just off-putting and um until your wedding (laughs) when uh I don't remember if I went through your endowment you did I did yep Of course you did. Of course, yeah. Yeah. But, and then you got married and I was a witness at the wedding. Yeah. And then we left the church like a month later. (laughs) we bounced. (laughs) We're like, okay, I see what this is all about. (laughs) Yeah, I think I was lucky because, like, because I was really worried about having to be naked in the temple, but I think I probably asked you and you were like, you won't have to be naked. And Mm. so by that point, by the time I went through the temple, I was mid-faith crisis. So were you when you took me through took me through Ugh, <laughs> cringe moment language so I don't know I felt like I maybe had like a decent idea of what was gonna happen because mm. I h- had just been like finding out too much already but I hadn't like seen videos or I didn't really know and I yeah I wouldn't say it was like a bad experience it was just kind of like a five out of ten experience you know and then I think there was some disappointment there but I probably kept it pretty squashed down mm-hmm. you know like I, I definitely expected it to be something it wasn't maybe and again I'm you know I always loved uh, English class growing up and you know finding meaning in anything like, I feel like my brain has always been quite wired to do that well so I was you know just my brain was just like tick, 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 the whole time just like desperate to try and find and that is a, out of what was happening. And Mormons, you were prime candidate for Mormonism. Prime, yeah, because seriously. Because that's very much the seriously. practice. So yeah, I mean, I suppose, looking back on it now, I just remember it as a bit of a non-event. But I remember it, it didn't do anything to help my faith crisis. Mm. And I think ultimately it probably hurt, I mean, it hurt it. Because I think seeing how culty it was, um, you know, alongside this growing awareness that this thing I'm in might be a cult, mm. you know, it wasn't ideal. But it, it wasn't like oh shit, this is, you know what I mean? It's like I had those feelings of discomfort at the cult-like rituals and stuff, um, but it took more time Mm. to, um, yeah. It it wasn't like an instant turn off going to the temple. But I only ended up, I think I've only done the endowment ceremony maybe like four times total. Mm. There's like different things you can do in the (laughs) temple. I haven't, I didn't go a bunch because I got into, I left the church, you know, a few months after um, but I remember go- after I was married, going to the temple, and I think w- me and my ex-husband, we just went a couple times or a few times. I didn't mind the ceilings too much, but ultimately I just remember, um, I remember one the last time we were supposed to go to the temple, for some reason the endowment got cancelled, mm-hmm. so we didn't have to do it, we just went home, and I felt such an intense relief. Oh, uh, you're like, I've proven my faith. This was like my <laughs> last, like, last ditch, like, I'm going to go to the temple because it just seems like it's the right thing to do. Like, my faith was, like, hanging by an absolute thread, and it was just major relief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I feel like my experience at the temple was generally a bit just lackluster and boring, really. But, I mean, in college, I remember having um, really powerful experiences maybe not really powerful, but I, good experiences. Go, I would go to the temple to do baptisms for the dead, which you can do before you're endowed. And I remember one time I was going through this um, really big breakup and I found this Jeffrey R. Holland article in the Enzyme that I was reading before going to do baptisms for the dead. Church magazine. for. And I remember students. just, yeah, sorry. Um, it feeling just like 
this huge sign, you know, everything I was reading, I was like, this is exactly what I needed to read. And, you know, it was a very spiritual experience and Jeffrey Ahalm was speaking right to my soul in that moment. And so I had experiences like that, you know, where I went to the temple and I did feel peace and I did feel, um, I suppose, loved by God or whatever. But yeah, I, I definitely had more positive experiences pre-endowment mm -hmm. and especially in college, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was probably the same for me too. And, you know, the earlier on, I was definitely more like hyped about the church and the more you learn and the more mm -hmm. you experience. I think I was always, I mean, I for sure was always hoping for there to be like some transcendent personal aspect mm -hmm. of church. Um, even like patriarchal blessing, which may be the only actually personal aspect of Mormonism where you're like, uh, an old guy gives you a specific blessing mm -hmm. that is like recorded and it's supposed to be just for you. And for some people, the, it gives them a lot of comfort and guidance and feels personal. And for, for some me, people, the patriarch says, I'm not getting anything. And then the couple dies on their way home. <laughs> is that real? It's like one, but I don't know. There's always flavors of those stories, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Like the, the patriarch couldn't get a connection and then the, the person legend. died <laughs> that day. <laughs> Uh, mine was just super <clears throat> like basic, just like, here's all the scriptural promises in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's like, basically I, like do all the shit you already know you're supposed to do. Yeah. I got home having like had so much anticipation, like I'm going to get my blessing. I like just sat in the car when we got home and just cried because I was like so disappointed, even though I couldn't even express that. I just felt it. Mm. And, and the temple, not as dramatic, but similar, like where I was going, looking for like, something that was going to be like whoa this is real and i'm connecting with a divine being who's like actually interested in me as a person um and just not finding that is um, mormonism does feel like just kind of like a one size fits all mm -hmm. religion and n never mm. more so than when you're wearing a one size fits all jumpsuit <laughs> uh, there is a there is a part where um i'd say like the part where i was like ooh I don't know if I even could say like culty, but I was, where I was like, mm, like at the time was when they do the prayer circle and they're all around the altar and they're doing, everyone's holding hands in this like ritual format and they're like repeating in monotone phrase, everything that the person oh, is praying I hate that. Yeah. and the women, you know, they have their faces veiled. And I remember that feeling like wanting it to feel good and not feeling good. What was the handkerchief thing they would do when they dedicated a new building in Rexburg? Um, okay. Every time they dedicate a new temple, they have a ritual called the Hosanna Shout. Oh my God, I hated that. <laughs> I hated that. I always thought it was so silly because I, I was like, a Hosanna Shout, we should be like, uh, there's a specific thing you should say, uh, you go, Hosanna, Hosanna to God and the Lamb. And it's supposed to be reminiscent of when they originally built the temple, you know, in biblical times, and everyone mm. shouted and cheered. But it's literally like everyone has the hanky and they go, so Hosanna, depressing. Hosanna. Hosanna to God and the Lamb. It's almost like because everyone knows it's cringe, so it would be more cringe to do it... Exuberantly. Bigger, yeah. <laughs> also, I'm just now realizing it's like, of course I got into Mormonism when Mormonism was just like seminary and reading scriptures and, you know, doing the English essay thing, but the minute they introduced group chanting... Oh, you've always hated out. group chanting. Hated group <laughs> they were never going to keep me. I just was like... This is so lackluster. Is no one excited about the new temple? Well, you have EFY counselor energy and you always will. So yeah, yeah. Everyone can't bring that, unfortunately. Di yeah, different vibes going on. Church contains multitudes mm -hmm. of vibes. <laughs> it was pretty common as a Mormon, I feel like, to go to the temple somewhat early on with your dating someone new, like to do mm. baptisms for the dead. Yeah. And I remember this probably was only like two weeks into me dating my ex-husband and he was like, you look so beautiful in white. And was like maybe crying, I don't remember. But mm. I feel like that was like a common thing where men would take you to the temple and then tell you you look beautiful. Uh, and <laughs> yep. And then when they do marry you, they're the one who pulls you through the veil and they get to hear your temple name, but you don't get to oh, hear yeah, theirs. Oh yeah, you get given a new name in the temple. We've got to mention that. Which even that I was at, hoping was going to be like a personal thing. Like you get your temple name, which is like your secret ceremonial, ceremonial name. But then you find out that it's just like literally on a calendar system and everyone who goes through that day Gets goes through. One. So my temple name was Alma, which mm -hmm. I still like as a name. I think it's cool. Um, and the if you're a woman, your husband finds out your name, but you never find out theirs. Yeah. 
But now I know yours. <laughs> Is yours Ruth? It was Ruby, but I oh, always Ruby. am like, was it Ruby or Ruth? I, I think Ruby. I think it yeah, was that Ruby, yeah. yeah. Another thing is just that you have to, you have to make the covenants on the spot with your whole family there. Yeah, we we've just talked about um, in our consent video, which we can link or you can look for. We talk a little bit more about this. How in order to properly consent, you have to understand what you're cons- what you're agreeing to before. You know, if you're drawing up a legal contract, you get to read that and agree to the terms and conditions, and that's just like standard for any type mm-hmm. of transaction or relationship. You have to know what you're doing. Um, religions often love to skirt that or dismiss it entirely and we see that in Mormonism where you're like you know that you'll be making really profound promises but you don't get to know exactly what they are until you're there and because Mormon you know one of them is like the law of chastity which is very common in Mormonism everybody knows that and so it's kind of like yes I will keep you know not doing anything that the church finds offensive Um, but then other stuff like no loud laughter which was a huge guilt trip for me I've talked about it Mm -hmm. a lot um, as someone who loves to laugh and make people laugh, I felt so much guilt as a young person for laughing because I had made a solemn vow in the temple not to do it. And then like other ones, which are way bigger, which is literally promising to give all your time and talents and money and whatever may be required of you to the church and the building up of the kingdom of God and, and all that. So it's like you're literally being put on the spot in front of all your friends and your family promising to give everything to the church without receiving any prior information about that before. And again, Mormons are primed in conditions or indoctrinated since children for that kind of thing that you're they just ever increasing amounts of devotion. You have to be willing to give your all to the kingdom of God and and all that. And so like I was like, yeah, at the time happy to be like, of course I'll do it. But looking back, I'm like, I didn't even properly consent to that, which is why I don't have any guilt about like talking openly about it or breaking my vow or whatever. Because it's like, I did not consent to that. I, I wasn't informed <laughs> that I was going to be promising. And not yeah. that I think it holds any vow, like authority anyway. But yeah, you don't buy into the premise anymore anyway. It's like one of my uh, other least favorite things, which is when people do public proposals that they haven't previously discussed and their partner doesn't even know a proposal is coming and they've gathered people there and I'm, and they, they have to say yes. <laughs> even if the answer is no, you have to say yes and then tell them later it's no. Or you wind up in one of those videos, those viral videos where they say no. And <laughs> oh, I saw a video of someone uh, proposing at TSA in an airport. It's like, oh. TSA? Yeah, through the, the security like, line? walk through the TSA Why checkout. Why would you do it there? Good question. Good question. Like I, mean, I can understand like at arrivals and you're picking someone up you haven't, or something like that. Good question. <laughs> security <laughs> checkpoint. Yep. I'm like shit, I was supposed to do it last night. So I just gotta get this done. Now that I know you don't have any weapons or dangerous chemicals on you, I can ask. Maybe they you met at TSA originally. Maybe you know. Maybe. Maybe something magical once... Why TSA? If at the airport, why TSA? I think uh, TSA is one of the few places left in America where you can just <laughs> expect to get a body rubbed down from a total stranger for mm-hmm. no reason. <laughs> yeah. And so maybe there's a romantic, fun aspect of that. Got know. it. Got it. <laughs> so long story mm-hmm. short about the temple. It's a good way of giving people something to do making them feel very, very Mm. special about it. Mm. and So true. They feel like they're making the world a better place by spending hours and hours doing this arbitrary shit, making them more blind to the actual stuff that is going on in the world. Because, you know, Mm. the more preoccupied you are with Mormonism, the less you care about climate change or anything else, anything else. I mean, they don't even believe in climate change, but you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's like you have... It's it's so convenient to just tell people that the best way you can make the world a better place is by just doing this very, you know, like, in-group arbitrary thing that leads to no actual you know outcome that's going to change the world in any way you're saving imaginary people (laughs) rather than always better to advocate for the imaginary (laughs) i think is what we learn from these kinds of we've learned that from the abortion debates (laughs) that imaginary people deserve so much more than real people so much more so much more Uh, Because, yeah, so much, all of those resources, all of that time and effort could be lent toward actually carrying out the the gospel, which the Bible states is visiting the homeless Mm -hmm. and the hungry, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked and all Mm -hmm. that. And not to say that church members of the church does nothing in that regard, only that there is a much, much bigger focus and budget uh, 
uh, allocation and time devotion toward the temple, um, which is literally doing dead works for people who you like are just not real. They are dead, dead and works. maybe they were alive at one point and. You know, according to Mormons, like they that may not even do anything for them. They may just like accept or not, mm-hmm. which seems like such a weird system mm-hmm. uh, for God, the Creator of the universe, to use while just like actual uh, interfacing with the world takes a back seat. Mm-hmm. And but you get to feel all the moral superiority, and it's like oh, there's nowhere else on earth where you can feel so much peace. And it's, and like, it's like I don't like, know. Yeah. You, you think you think Catholics are going like sitting down in a cathedral, which is uh, we went to Stunning. cathedrals in England, yeah. and it, you can't help but like be overwhelmed with the beauty of the experience. It's literally created for that. And you sit down, and you're like, yeah, this is exactly, exactly like a temple. It's not like people in cathedrals are like, I just wish there was a better place where I could feel mm. more peace and closer to God. It's like that is the way they've been conditioned, the setting yeah. that they've been conditioned to find peace and tranquility and connection with the divine. And same in a Hindu temple, same in a mosque. It's no different. It's literally the same... Uh, like psychosocial mechanism that's being activated, um, but Mormons see it as being like so much better and more real, and the only place where families can be together, and the only place with authority to bind families eternally, and they get married there. And even though it's not actually an official Mormon doctrine, non-members aren't allowed to witness the weddings. Mm-hmm. Like you have to be a tithe-paying Mormon to witness a Mormon wedding, yeah. Which is so sad because I wouldn't like get married and tell my Mormon family that they couldn't come because Mm -hmm. they weren't worthy to see me get married. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just nuts. And I think that's something that will change probably within the next 15 years. Oh, that'd be interesting, yeah. Because, I mean, it is such a big control tool. That just doesn't need to be, and I think people will eventually get tired of it in the same way that they've got tired of uh, ankle and wrist-length garments and got tired of women veiling their faces and got tired of promising that their throats would be slit and their bowels ripped out and mm. things change. Yeah. But now we've lost the purity of the the ordinances. You used to get bathed in whiskey, damn it, and now they've just watered it down literally and they only wash your head symbolically, just like the Catholics. Yeah, but not Warren Jeffs. I bet he's still doing it the real way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We want to know your temple experiences. Did you have anything less lackluster happen? Anything exciting? Tell us in the comments below. Yeah, what was your first impressions uh, for those uh, people outside of the church? Uh, if you have any other questions about it, curiosity, ask in the comments and we'll, we'll try to answer. Yeah, and also I'd be curious to hear about like how the temple um, interplayed with your like relationship with the church in general, like whether it was like a thing that strengthened your overall commitment and faith or whether it was a point of... Uh, distress for you within your faith. I don't know. Just curious. All right. Well, thanks for watching. Tune in next time as we talk about something else. Well, no, don't tune in next time (laughs) until you've heard me say that. If you want to support the channel, please support us on Patreon. We really, really, well, we do rely on Patreon to be able to do this as our jobs. So, um, yeah, it really means a lot. And thank you to those of you who are patrons. We do fun bonus content there. It's a good time. Yeah, thank you, patrons. We love you so much. Also, we have merch and we have a candle and there's other ways you can support us in the description box. My candle ran out last night. Mm, I have to re-up because now I'm hooked on it. All right, thanks for watching. We love you. Bye.